The views and opinions expressed on this program are those of the participants and do not reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. BronxNet. Your voice, your views, your vision. Show that I'm from the Bronx and the world's your cafe con leche. As always, here to bring you the best from arts, music, sports, entertainment, and so much more. First up, we'll introduce an impressive and innovative Latin band that we're listening to right now. We're gonna have a little chat with them. Then we'll find out what fun events are taking place in today's open weekend preview. A local gallery is showcasing an exciting celebration of indigenous African tools and instruments. Find out where. After, celebrate more African special events today at the Joyce Kilmer Park. There will be a summer outdoor film festival in collaboration with the African Film Festival. And by the way, it is free, so make sure you... Stay tuned to find out more. And finally, go check out a group exhibition featuring interactive multimedia projects, all timeless and inspirational pieces. They're found in a very impressive New York City gallery. Our guests today include members of the BronxNet family, Lehman Director, and Bobby C. Special Guests in Bobby C. Sports Corner. And we're going to close out today's show with the band that has played all around the world, including the opera. Carmen at the Metropolitan Opera in Lincoln Center. So don't go anywhere. All that or more heading away because now we are officially open. Hello and welcome once again to Open Rina Valentin here, your cafe con leche siempre los viernes. That is Friday, and today is Friday, July 15, 2011. And we are, you know, always inviting you to send in any comments or suggestions on any segments that you would like to see aired and or have previously aired. And of course, all you have to do is send us an email to open at bronxnet.org. And if you're watching us live this Friday morning at 10 a.m., all you got to do is pick up that phone and give us a call at 718-960-7241. Now, you're listening to the nice, smooth sounds that tried, we gave our DJ the day off. So let's welcome the band that's actually going to be playing throughout the entire show, Los Sindrón. Hola. Hola. Hola, hola. Good morning. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us this morning. Yeah, well, it's my pleasure. Good to now, be here. Yes. Uh, well, you guys have a, a nice, extensive uh, bio. I mean, you've traveled all over the world. Tell us a little bit about this music. Uh, well, what we play is basically a flamenco, form of flamenco. We're originally from Spain. Uh, what are some of the places, more interesting places we've been to, like uh, Moscow, Moscow? Moscow, London, Rome. Nice. Spain. <coughs> New, New York. <laughs> and New York, and now in the Bronx. Now the now in the Bronx, Bronx <laughs> and they boogie down. <laughs> no, no, no. All right, so um, <coughs> is, uh, the band itself, Los Intron, there's more of you, right? Yeah, we have more elements. We're the basic elements because we're Los Intron, the brothers Intron. Nice, so tell me a little bit about that. Well, we get along still after uh, playing for 25 years together. <laughs> nice. Are you actually brothers? Yes, we are. You yes. are? Yes. Nice. How yes. is that working with a family member? You could it's imagine. fine, as long as we don't drink. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. <laughs> Where are you guys from? Originally from Salamanca, Spain. Uh huh. And uh, we were born there, and then we came here at a young age, and we were raised here. Nice. And, and back and forth. And, and um, 
You actually uh, have a, a wonderful cruise that's going on on Sunday. Uh, well, it's not your cruise, but you're playing right, on this right. fabulous cruise. Yeah, we'll be with more members of the band and two lovely, beautiful dancers uh, on the Jewel Cruise Line. That We're actually out of 23rd doing a tribute to the Gypsy Kings on uh, the cruise. Yeah, so if you like Gypsy so Kings, there's going to be a lot a of music that you know, and uh, it's going to be a great summer night, yeah. A lot of fun. All right, are you going to be playing something from the Gypsy Kings for us at the end of the show? Why not? Sure. Oh, throughout the show? I mean, you're going to be playing throughout the show. Yeah, yes. we'll be with you all morning. So. All right, <laughs> looking forward to it. Nice to meet you. All right, gracias. Gracias. No, no. Los Cintron. Beautiful. All right, people. It's kind of mellow today. And Elegante, that's what we're doing here in Open this Friday. And of course, uh, well, you know, there's lots of other things to do this weekend. And uh, you know, we know what to tell you because it is now time for our Open Weekend Preview. And first up, Bob Gallery presents Igueras, now through July 31st. David Hernayes Concepcion provides a show that celebrates the functional and symbolic attributes of gourds that is, that is the hard shelled fruits of various plants. These ornaments are often used in indigenous communities and throughout the African diaspora as kitchen tools, water bearing vessels, and other instruments. Higueras will showcase these excuse me, consecrated fruits of nature multimedia artwork. Uh, again, that's happening at Bob Gallery, located on 235 Eldridge Street. That's in New York. And if you're interested in RSVPing, send an email to bob.gallery at gmail.com. Next up, Go to Joyce Kilmer Park or the Bronx Museum if it's a rainy day, which I don't hear it's going to be a rainy day, but uh, to get a thrill that is of Bronx Africa. That's right. This is a summer special outdoor film screening in collaboration with the African Film Festival. This event, First Fridays, takes place on the first Friday of every month for films and video screenings, art performances, music, and other special events. It's free, love that word, no cover charge, that's right. There will be music by Iboru, an East African MC that plays, uh, that plays Afro-Cuban, Yoruba, and Rumba music, Rumba music. And there's also going to be a screening of the film called Ali Wanna Do and Bongo Barbershop, as, as, as well as many uh, other exciting African cultural performances. Joyce Kilmer Park is on Grand Concourse, and that is uh, Grand Concourse to Walton Avenue between uh, 161st and East 164th Street. Uh, again, once again, that's East 161st and East 164th Street. It's happening today, today. July 15th from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. as well as every first Friday of every month from now on. So make sure you get out and enjoy. All right, lastly, Taller Boricua is proud to present Barrio Rama. Barrio Rama, which is a group exhibition featuring artists like Neira Collazo Lawrence, Rosalinda Gonzalez, and Johnny Ramos. Too. That's just to name a few. Barrio Rama celebrates the East Harlem community, also addressing the different perspectives and challenges, challenging issues of the neighborhood. These multi-talented media artists are everything from photographers to videographers, all presenting stunning works of art of East Harlem and the East Harlem neighborhood. The last day of the art ex exhibition is tomorrow, July 16th, Saturday, July 16th. The gallery hours are from 12 noon to 6 p.m. And Taller Boricua Gallery is located at uh, 1680 Lexington Avenue. 1680 Lexington Avenue, that's located at 106th Street in Lexington Avenue. And for more information, you can go to tallerboricua.org. And once again, that's also free. We love that work, free admission. So make sure you guys get out there and enjoy lots of art, 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 art for all of you this weekend. And that is our open weekend preview. So make sure you get out and enjoy this lovely weekend. All right, before we go to break, if you missed any of the National Puerto Rican Day Parade action last month, you can always catch it 
on bronxnet.org. And here's what you do. You go to bronxnet.org uh, by clicking on the Bronx Media tab, then scroll down to Bronxnet Packages, okay, which I believe we're getting to, Bronxnet Packages. It's to your right. Where is Bronxnet? There it is. It's going down to the bottom. Click, and you click there. Click on Bronxnet Packages. Uh, once you click on that, then it's going to lead you into the package page and uh, there you'll be able to see the actual package of the uh, National Puerto Rican Day Parade. All right, and so, now, <clears throat> we went from the National Puerto Rican Day Parade to the Saisa Fest, see? The first uh, annual Saisa Fest revived the tradition of Saisa at Orchard Beach last week. And uh, last weekend, Bronx Net cameras, as well as myself, were there to capture. So let's take a look. Hey, now, Valentin, and we're here at Orchard Beach for some fun, sun, and salsa. The first annual Bronx Salsa Fest began on July 7th and concluded with salsa on the sand. As live music returns to Orchard Beach with Nelson Gonzalez and the All Star Band. I'm, I'm mainly I'm playing Afro Cuban music, mm -hmm. which is what I play. I could play a little bit of jazz. I could play a little bit of everything, but mainly the people that comes here, they just want to party. This event, courtesy of Latino Sports, Bronx Lebanon Hospital, and the National Museum in Harlem, was hosted by Bronx Borough President Ruben Diaz Jr. and the Bronx Tourism Council with the hopes of reviving the tradition of Saisa at Orchard Beach to continue. Many of them used to come to me for the last two or three summers and say, where's the live band? And so here we have it for them again and hopefully we're going to continue this from now on. While there were lots of people who came out to Orchard Beach to enjoy and dance to the rhythms of Saisa music, we came across some visitors from out of town. So I won't tell anybody that we found a Korean Saisa on Orchard Beach, baby! I'm born and raised here and uh, I moved to Georgia in uh, 95. I'm from Connecticut, actually. He's and from I'm from Rochelle, New York. A short while from here, up in New Rochelle. The stage was hosted by Julio Pavo of Latino Sports, who also obtained hundreds of signatures to retire the number 21, a campaign he's been advocating to retire a number baseball player Roberto Clemente used to wear. What people don't understand is that retiring Clemente's number is not just about baseball. Clemente's number needs to be retired, and it's about Latinos. While the band was on break, Zumba instructor Hilda Rosario took over the stage with a demonstration of this new innovative workout that includes various forms of dance. Zumba! Audience participated, and of course, I couldn't help but join in. That is all for today, folks! But the concert series at Orchard Beach is scheduled to continue July 17th with Dave Valentin and July 24th with Tipica 73. So make sure you come out and enjoy the Latin sounds of the Bronx Riviera. For more information, you can go to ilovethebronx.com. I'm Rina Valentin reporting for Open. It's summertime, people. You saw that? That's right. We are rocking it at Orchard Beach. So make sure you check out the website once again at ilovethebronx.com. And well, like I said, it's summer in the Bronx, so that means what? It's time for Summer Works. That's right, the annual theater and dance festival at Lehman College. And well, Henry Ovalles is the assistant director of Lehman Stages, and he's here to talk about all the fun free events and shows that are coming up. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, good morning, Rena. Thank good, you for well, us. thank you for being here with us and, uh, of course, providing all this wonderful art, art, art. Today is art, art, art. <laughs> yes, good, good. Yes, yes, yes. So, uh, where shall we begin uh, other than the word free? We love the word free. Yes, free is good. Yes. Well, yeah, as you mentioned before, this is our Lehman Stages Summer Works Festival. This is about the seventh year that we're doing the festival, and we do a lot of free events for the community. We want you guys to come and enjoy, you know, great quality uh, art programming. So we have a few things that already happened, like the Bronx International Film Festival and a concert called Summer Sessions that we're very successful and we're very happy about. And what you have coming up uh, tonight, tomorrow night, and Sunday night at 8 o'clock, we have a show called Broadway Under a Bronx Moon, where everybody could come out. It's outdoors. It's supposed to be a very nice weekend. So you come, you gaze at the stars, uh, you bring, you know, somebody that you like or love, and you watch some... Uh, some great Lehman students and alumni uh, with the band singing some Broadway, uh, Broadway songs, songs from Fame, Jesus Christ Superstar, In the Heights, uh, Hair, 
Uh, so you could come and enjoy that all for free. Yeah, we love that. And it's going to be a full moon tonight, too. That's right. It's going to be a full moon. What time does this start? It'll be 8 o'clock. And like I said, again, full moon. So Broadway and the Bronx Moon is the name of the show. So you'll be able to enjoy that there. That's beautiful. Now, where in the campus are, are, is this being presented? It's going to be right in the middle of the campus. The, the, there's a big area in the campus called the Peace Grove. It's the quad. It's this big grassy area right in the middle of the campus. You can't miss it. So that's where you could come. And you'll hear the music and, and uh, listen oh, to the great singers. Oh, it sounds so, uh, yes. And then you bring your blank. It, exactly. You bring your stuff to nibble on, and, and you just sit back and enjoy the wonderful sounds of Broadway That's under right. the moon. Exactly. Exactly. That's and right. it's a nice, sweet, short show. It's uh, two acts, about 45 minutes each. So it's a 90-minute show. You come, you sit back, relax, and see some great singers and some great dancers. Also, they, there's a little choreography in there, too. Okay, so that's tonight, July 15th. That's July tonight, tomorrow night, and Sunday night at right, 8 o'clock. Right, so tonight, July 15th, tomorrow, July 16th, and Sunday, July 17th. That's correct, 8 o'clock. Right, 8 o'clock, all three days. All three days, all free. All free. Yes. Free. Love that word, free. <laughs> All right, so what else you got? And then next week we have something out starting up. It's the Bronx Solo Performance Festival. It's the first annual Bronx Solo Performance Festival uh, where we have four actors just coming and sort of telling their stories, uh, solo performances, basically going back to the roots of theater where you just have one actor on stage telling their story, uh, you know, going back to the roots of storytelling. Uh, and that's going to be very exciting. Uh, I've been to a couple of the rehearsals, and that's that's going to be really, really cool. So uh, how long? These are one-person shows, right? Yes, one-person shows, and we have four actors. Uh, they'll be performing each night. Do you the know shows who the actors are? Yes, we have Jose Roldan Jr., we have Phoebe Smith, we have Jamali Corniel, and we have Lawrence Mays coming and telling their stories. And they're buried people. Some of them, you know, have a, a big dance experience. Some of them, uh, Lawrence, for example, is big into poetry. Uh, so you'll see a, a lot of different flavors there, and it's really going to be Are fun. they all being presented uh, simultaneously? Yes, it'll be simultaneously. Like one right after the other? One right after the other, yeah. It's a two-hour show. And that starts next Thursday, July July 21st, and that runs through uh, through the 31st of July. So two weeks of that, Thursday through Sunday, and Thursday through Sunday. Nice, nice, nice. You guys are really active today. Uh, and, well, not today. You're active today because <laughs> you're actually telling We're us everything active. there yes. is to do today uh, and throughout the weekend. And then finally, you have yes. Kids Rule, which looks like my favorite. <laughs> yes, and Kids Rule is actually our favorite event also. We, it's probably our biggest event of the year. That's going to be uh, Thursday, August 4th through Sunday, August 7th. On August 4th and August 5th, that's a Thursday and a Friday. We have theater days at 10 and 11.30 at the Lovinger Theater, where you get to come and see two children's theater shows. Uh, the first one's called I'll Huff and I'll Quack and I'll Blow Down Your Porridge, uh, which is a mixture of The Ugly Duckling and Goldilocks and the Three Bears and some surprises thrown in. Nice. Uh, and then we'll also be show presenting Ferdinand the Bull, which is a great also children's theater show. Uh, and then the most exciting thing is on Saturday and Sunday, the 6th and the 7th, we have our Fresh Air Fun Day where we have pony rides, we have bouncy castles, we have magic shows, we have children's theater, there's face painting, uh, and it's all, again, free for everybody to come we out. We love that. Love that. You hear Charm Viva on the side going, yes. <laughs> yes. Face painting, mommy. <laughs> no, she didn't exactly say that. She said free. Yes. <laughs> free and face painting and pony rides. Yes, pony rides. Yes. No, I'm just looking at this because you said the 5th and 6th. So this is a, an August event. So we're going to actually probably invite you guys back on. To that would be great. Give us a, a nice little taste of the Kids Rule weekend. Yeah, and the Kids Rule weekend on that Saturday and Sunday is going to be from 12 to 5 p.m. You just come again, enjoy the outdoors uh, fun uh, and fresh air, and you have, you know, plenty of space for the kids to run around and jump on bouncy castles. And this, year's, we're, this year we're actually going to have a water slide, which we're very excited about. A water slide? Yes. What That's more can you ask awesome. for? That's awesome. Charm you heard that? A water slide. <laughs> She's learning how to swim. Not. <laughs> <laughs> She can't stand the swimming classes anyway, but oh, no, no. We're, we're, uh, this is, I just had to because it's like water slide. That sounds like so much fun. Hopefully she'll be over her water fright uh, by the time the water slide comes in. But however, um, th there's a lot going on. Uh, we started with this weekend into last uh, next week and then into August. So um, if somebody wanted to obtain the calendar on all of these particular events, where would they go directly to? Uh, what they want to do is call our box office number. There's all the information there. That's 718-960-8025. And also, probably easier, you could go to our website, which is www.lehmanstages.org, and you can see pictures and all the information, times, and dates right there. Nice, nice, nice. And once again, so we just went over like three different I know, uh, it's projects. A lot. <laughs> and, but Broadway Under the Moon is, starts tonight, which is July 15th. It's tonight, July 15th, 16th, and 17th, 8 o'clock, free. 
Uh, it sounds really, really cool, especially because it's a full moon. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's timed perfectly, and you know you can bring your blankets and just kind of just lounge around and, and listen to some beautiful Broadway without paying Broadway prices. <laughs> right. <laughs> and that's kind of cool, right? And then uh, he's got the BX solo, which are uh, four person, one one person show, four people, one person shows that are actually going to be shown together, and that's going to be like a week or two right. Weeks, starts right? next week on right, next week July twelfth. I'm sorry, July 21st uh, through, the through, 31st. through the 31st. Right. And, um, and then, of course, the kids rule, my favorite. Kids <laughs> rule. Because yes. kids rule. Yes, because <laughs> they do. I call mine La Jefa. <laughs> I do. I call La Jefa. I'm a sure weekend of fun, games, magic, and theater for kids. And this is taking place in August. So make sure you go check them out on the website. However, we are going to invite them back on just to go over the whole itinerary as we get closer to August. Fantastic. All right. Thank you, Henry, for coming through. And once again, if you want to uh, get more information, you can call them at 718-960-8025. Uh, and always visit them on the, online 24-7 uh, at Lehman Lehman Center. Stages.org. Lehman Stages. Yes. yes. All right, so let's just be clear about that. It's www.leamanstages.org. Once again, thank you, Henry, for coming in and sharing all this wonderful information for you guys to get out and do for free. Yay. Love that. <laughs> all right, don't go anywhere next. Bobby C. brings you the top news in sports. So we'll be right back. Thank you. Thank you. That was awesome. <laughs> Longtime Bronx Public School educator Janet Grossback Mayer was at Hood Bookstore on Westchester Avenue off Prospect Avenue to talk about her newly released book, As Bad As They Say. It's a title that came out of a letter exchange she began in 1995 with a school in South Africa. In some of the first letters received, the students wanted to know, is the Bronx as bad as they say? That was all she needed to commit to writing a book to set the record straight. I was astonished. The kids were astonished. We had no idea the reputation of the Bronx. So then and there, I knew I was going to write a book to change the stereotype. Grossback Mayer read excerpts from her book. The names of the schools where she taught and her students are fictitious to hide their identities. Nonetheless, each one demonstrates the spirit and character of Bronx kids making good grades despite difficult circumstances. Teresa Chiaramonte is one of Grossback Mayer's former students. She graduated from Lehman High School in 1987 and credits her for instilling within her a love for learning. We were leaving for summer school. I didn't want to go. And she goes, well, I'll see you in September. I'm like, all right. So I was like, am I going to have you for a teacher, a reading teacher? You know, how's it go? I ended up having her for three semesters before she left. The book also includes a scathing assessment of the current condition of public education. Education. And it's really important to know that our students are being cheated, that what's going on is not working, the reforms are not working, we're spending billions of our taxpayers' dollars, and they're not helping. That's nationally. Here in New York City, Mayor shared that while current New York City Schools Chancellor Dennis Walcott has a deep understanding and a stake in the success of public education, she says that was not the same for his predecessors. Fine, who knows nothing about education, retires, and he hires Kathleen Black, who is also a media mogul, who didn't even go to public school. At least Joel Klein went to a public school. She had no background, so it took only three months. But the person is a very nice gentleman, Mr. Walcott now, but he is a yes man for Bloomberg. He has never dissented. He will not dissent. Then it was time to sign copies of her book for her guests, many of whom were also teachers. I don't teach in New York City public schools. I teach in Westchester County, okay, and I teach special education. And Janet is really a role model, I must say. Retired Bronx public school teacher Laverne Harris and now owner of Hood Bookstore shared that she was happy to bring in Mayor to talk about a subject so important to the future of the Bronx. I have to say that I just retired a year ago from the Department of Ed. So I was a teacher for over 27 years. And so naturally I know the importance of education and I know the importance of reading. That's what it's all about. I love to read. And a book that's really based on memoirs really grabs me. Her days of teaching are far from over. 
over. She just completed her 50th year of teaching. Now with her book out, she wants to continue to rally on behalf of Bronx students. Mayor shared during her talk that the policies in place are not benefiting kids. She said she'd like to see more parents involved. She talked about a march on Washington called SOS Save Our Children, and that's where she'll be. For BronxNet, this is Arlene Makoko. This is Bobby C. reporting from Yankee Stadium. The captain, hats off to him because he certainly has a knack for the dramatic. DJ 3K goes down as one of the finest moments in Bronx baseball history. It may have taken Jeter a little longer than expected, but the all-star shortstop who returned from the DL earlier in the week did what he always does, save his best for the biggest stage. Jeter collected his 3,000 hit on Saturday and then added four more to his credit, going five for five in a dazzling performance against AL East rival Tampa Bay. Number two went Hollywood, homering for number 3,000 against Rays starter David Price, which tied the game at 1-1, and would later smash a tie-breaking single in the eighth inning that gave the Bronx Bombers a 5-4 win. This is already movie ready uh, to get your um, 3,000th hit and a home run that ties the game, and then you get 3,000 and three, a game winner. It's just remarkable. It was hard for Jeter to eclipse himself, from the flip to the dive to Mr. November, but his long ball put him in even more exclusive company. Jeter not only became the first Yankee to ever attain the 3,000 hit milestone, but by homering, he became only the second player of the 28 in history to do so via the home run. I've grown up with these fans, and uh, you know, I'm glad that, like I said before, I had an opportunity to do it here because it just wouldn't have felt right to do it somewhere else. The Yankee fans have, have always been great. You know, I've, I've said it time and time again, they appreciate the history of the sport, history of the organization. The thing that means the most to me is that uh, I've been able to get all these hits in the Yankee uniform. When Jeter arrived at home plate, the last remaining parts of the core four joined in celebration with Jorge Posada giving Jeter a bear hug and Rivera mobbing the captain in a moment that will be forever etched in time. I got, I got a little emotional because, uh, I mean, I was so happy for him. He's amazing what he's able to do, but he, he, for him, is he looks forward to that moment. Go out there and get five hits today. He just, he's amazing. Fittingly, Rivera saved Jeter's turn-back-the-clock performance. You're talking about from Bay Roof to uh, Yogi Berra and, and DiMaggio, Mickey Mantle and all those guys, and none of them have 3,000, and then here comes Derek Jeter for so many years. For us, I mean, I'm extremely happy for him. It was Jeter's first five-hit game since 2005 and the first ever for any player of the new Yankee Stadium, something that fans from near and far wouldn't miss. I know it's a great feeling for Derek, and I know it's a great feeling for the Bronx fans, and I know back home in Kalamazoo, Michigan, they're partying up a storm, baby, you know, because that's still their guy, you know, it's still our guy. As for the lucky youngster that nabbed the home run, the 23-year-old from Highland Mills never had any intention to keep it. It's his accomplishment. This is a milestone. Like someone said, only 27 other people have done this. Uh, it's not an everyday thing, and he deserves every second of it. As for the fans of the Bronx, the 161st Street bid did their best to make the moment extra sweet, too. Everybody in the neighborhood was out here cheering and waiting for the free cake. We had a line of people by the sixth inning, kids uh, waiting for cake. Uh, parents celebrating, and uh, I think it was a really special moment for the Bronx, really a special moment for knitting the neighborhood and the Yankees closer together. Iconic moments like the one Derek Jeter provided last weekend are nothing new for the Bronx Bombers. The New York Yankees, like Jeter, have always had a flair for the dramatic and for storybook endings. Fifty years ago in the summer of 1961, legends Mickey Mantle and Roger Maris were authoring a new ending to the pursuit of Babe Ruth's single-season home run record. Chronicling that history right here in the Bronx was a young writer named Phil Pepe. Today, he joins us in the Sports Corner to tell us about his latest book, 1961 Asterisk, The Inside Story of the Maris Mantle Home Run Chase. On this date, July 15, 1961, the chase was really starting to heat up. The Yankees were 55-30 and, and defeated the Chicago White Sox 9-8. And as Maris went 3-for-6 with a Ballantine blast, as the late great Mel Allen would say. And then the m and boys continued their assault on Root's cherished record. The mix stood at 31, and Maris, the kid who grew up in Fargo, North Dakota, and many believed had no right hunting the babe, stood at 35. 
Thank you so much for joining us today in the Sports Corner. You were there for it all. Bring us to August 2nd, 1960. July 15th, I was minding my own business, not doing much of anything, maybe covering some uh, local golf tournament or something. And next thing you know, a couple of weeks later, I'm covering the Yankees, not only covering the New York Yankees, who were in a close pennant chase with the Detroit Tigers, but I'm in the middle of one of the most historic events in baseball in history. history. I, mean, I certainly was not prepared for such a thing. So for the kids at home, I think most of them will know Mark McGuire, Sammy Sosa, Barry Bonds, and the fact that the record these days belongs to those guys. To put it in perspective, an all-star this past week, Jose Bautista has 31 home runs at the break. We just mentioned it, Roger Maris, Mickey Mantle, 35-31. You point out in the book that no player had a September like Babe Ruth in 1927. Talk a little bit more about Ruth in, in that year. Yeah, well, that was a record that uh, everybody assumed would never be broken. I mean, Babe Ruth couldn't even break it himself. He hit the, the he broke the, the record. He held the record at 60. Never came uh, close to. I guess he hit 59 another time later on. But they thought that he would be the one to raise the record. It never happened. Players came along. There were, there were several challenges uh, to the record. Jimmy Fox hit 58. Hank Greenberg hit 58. Hack Wilson hit 56. But they all hit a wall in September. Babe Ruth hit 17 home runs in the month of September. At the time, that was amazing. Nobody could compete with that. So these guys have this great pace so far, but it doesn't really mean anything at that point in the season. Well, the people were suspicious. You know, they were doubtful. They were, they were skeptical. They didn't think that anybody would break it. What they did have, however, was an additional eight games because expansion had come to the American League in 1961. So they went from a, an eight-team league to a ten-team league, and consequently they had to increase the schedule from 154 games to 162. And so Maris and Mantle, or everybody, had eight additional games that Babe Ruth, an advantage over what Babe Ruth had. And that was the source of a controversy. So much controversy in 1961. You talk about legends in the book, a guy like Ty Cobb, who really wasn't a big fan of Babe Ruth when he was playing. But in 1961, he didn't want to see Ruth's record fall. What he wanted to do was not protect Babe Ruth's record so much as protect his era, era his guys, his people. So he was campaigning. You should not uh, break a record if you have an, an additional eight games advantage. Keep that record intact, you know, and it doesn't matter whether it was Ruth or anybody else. It was his, from his era. Phil, Maris clearly wasn't the fan favorite in 1961. I, I think he kind of reminds me a little bit of how Lou Gehrig must have been to Babe Ruth in 1927, where he was a dominant player, at least in those couple of years, 60 and 61, but always played second fiddle to the Babe. And in 61, Maris playing second fiddle to the Mick. Well, everybody played second fiddle to the Babe. I mean, it was <laughs> inevitable. You couldn't help that. And I certainly had no idea. I, I wasn't around then in those days, obviously. So I don't know how the perception of the fan was to, uh, to Gehrig. I suspect it was pretty good but he wasn't Babe Ruth in this case Maris was difficult uh, the, the things that came out in the uh, Billy Crystal movie indicated that you know he was surly he wasn't surly he wasn't hostile he was just difficult because he didn't he wasn't forthcoming he didn't want the spotlight he didn't he was humble he didn't want to talk about himself and when you interviewed him he gave you platitudes he didn't give you any long in, it wasn't a Reggie Jackson type of interview so that was one of the problems. The other thing was that most people felt, and the, the players, the Yankees themselves, I quote Moose Scourin in the book saying that they wanted Mantle to break the record. They felt he was the deserving guy because he came up through the Yankee system. He had been their star, their leader, their go-to guy uh, for so many years, won a triple crown, won a couple of home run championships. They thought he was the logical guy to break the record, but didn't mean that they were rooting against Maris. They just preferred Mantle. The younger generation has probably learned about that 61 season through the Billy Crystal HBO film and now hopefully through your book. Can you talk about that media portrayal? Because in the film you say that it's, it's not completely accurate. What was it like covering the Eminem well, Boys in 61? My feeling was that Hollywood needs a protagonist. You know, they need a villain uh, to make it an interesting story. So they decided that the villain was going to be the media. Uh, and I think that was a, a stretch. That was an exaggeration. I don't remember people rooting, openly rooting against Maris to break the record or knocking him. Or comp We complained. They complained about the fact that he was a difficult interview because he wasn't giving them anything. But other than that, there was no animosity towards him and, and, and no uh, reason to root against him, I don't believe. 
The asterisk will always be synonymous with 1961 and Maris and Mantle. But you point out in the book that Commissioner Ford Frick really never instituted one. That came uh, uh, about uh, accidentally. What happened was there was all this pressure on Frick as the commissioner to make a decision on what are you going to do about the extra eight games. He was getting pressure from old-time players, old-time writers, uh, people in baseball, fans. At the same time, he had his, his, his own dilemma. He was a very close friend of the Babes. He had been babe, as, uh, Frick had been a sports writer and was Babe's ghost writer. writer. So he was trying to protect the legacy of his buddy in one, in one way and also the interest of the game itself in another. Maris and Mantle, Phil, they lose out on a home run during the season. You definitely re recapture the entire season of 61, which is great. But to me, a great story now, and this is being talked about, of course, all over the place with this young kid that caught Jeter's 3,000 milestone, is the story of Sal Durante. Can you bring us back to that day, October 1st, 1961? The, the fact that 23,000 people showed up at Yankee Stadium, which held, you know, 60, 8,000, whatever, 60 to 70,000 people could have gone there. Only 23,000 people showing up for that historic day is mind-boggling. I, I mean, I, I have no explanation for it. Uh, some people say it was because of the, the memorabilia craze hadn't taken hold. Well, there was a restaurateur out of Seattle who was offering $5,000 if you caught that ball and gave it to him, he'd give you a $5,000 check. In 1961, you could buy two brand new Fords for less than $5,000 and fill them both with gas for a whole year, as I point out in the book. I, I did my own research and, and found out that in 1961, my gross income was $9,000. <laughs> so $5,000 was, was quite a, a, a bonanza. And yet only 23,000 people showed up. Not only that, but this kid, Sal Durante, 19 years old, living in Brooklyn in, in Coney Island, wakes up that morning and decides he's going to go to the game and he's going to sit in the right field seats and gets to the ballpark maybe an hour or two before game time and is able to get the seats he chose. Do you think that can happen today? No way. <laughs> and then you saw it too last week with Jeter, all the fans outside after that rain out on Friday night. I mean, over 50,000 fans for that milestone. You would think back in 1961 that the, the feeling would be the same. Well, the Yankee attendance in 1961, I think, was about 1.6 or 1.7 million. I think it's so, 1.7 in the book, And yeah. today they're draw drawing close to, four, you know, close to and over 4 million. So that's the difference. Will we ever see another season like 1961 where two teammates have this remarkable chase? Oh, I think it's poss possible. possible. I don't know if I'll be around for it, but I think, uh, yeah, the way think guys are hitting home runs nowadays. Uh, I think you might have something like that, sure. We're up against it in terms of time, but one of the final questions that I had was three epilogues in the book. You go over a lot of great stuff. Greatest Yankee team, 27, 1961. Roger Maris's place. Do you, do you think he's a Hall of Famer? I don't. You don't. I would. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you want me to tell you why? Uh, real quick, I yes. just don't think that you put a guy in the Hall of Fame based on one season. There are players like Dave Parker, Don Mattingly, Dale Murphy, Veda Pinson. None of them are in the Hall of Fame, and they all had better careers Players. than Roger Maris. Well, he definitely had one great season, yes, and this did. is one great book. I wanted to thank you thank for you. coming on. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have today in the Sports Corner. Phil Pepe kept a journal of his articles from that amazing 1961 season where he chronicled the chase between Maris and Mantle for the New York World Telegram and Sun. And now you can relive one of the greatest years in baseball history by picking up his book, 1961, Asterisk, the inside story of the Maris-Mantle home run chase. The book is available at all major retailers, including Barnes & Noble and through the publisher, Triumph Books at www.triumphbooks.com. If you don't act fast, this book will be going going gone just like this segment we'll be right back with more open after this the bronx is the birthplace of salsa and here at pregones theater the kickoff to salsa fest starts the bronx hosted the first ever bronx salsa fest with world-renowned talent like benny bonillo and orlando marin obviously my mother didn't have no money to give me lessons because I wanted to learn music. I didn't know what I wanted. Anyway, make a long story short, her mother, my grandmother, knew I liked music, so she gave me an oatmeal box. So with the with the radio on and and the rumbas, not mambo, rumbas would come on and I would bang away on my oatmeal box. What better way to start this event but with the critically acclaimed From Mambo to Hip Hop, A Tale of the South Bronx.
get funding and everything, it took about seven years to get funding and to finish the project. And so it was done in 2000, and around 2004, 2005, and then on PBS. So, um, yeah, so um, it, it was a long process, but I think, and, and it started out just really wanting to um, learn about the history, okay. learn about the history of all the dance halls. We realized the Bronx had such a great history, and we were really concerned that the Bronx was more than just burning buildings that people, you know, those images that you saw. That's kind of the reputation, the image that the whole world still has of the Bronx, and we wanted to show that there's a lot more. Salsa is the result of neo rican musicians mixing the Cuban mambo with a sprinkling of jazz to create a new sound. The Puerto Rican contribution is that when we got here in uh, the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, etc., we adopted the music, adapted it, and made incredible contributions to it, particularly from the uh, progressive side of things with musicians like Maestro Tito Puente, who took up the banner of what Machito and the Afro-Cubans did here in New York in 1939. They were the first band to fuse jazz arranging technique with pure Cuban rhythms, and people like Tito Puente, who played in the band when he was young, very young in Spanish Harlem, took those te techniques and even modernized them even more. The event moved the audience from screen to stage with these world-renowned dancers. And these salsa legends provide a nostalgic and romantic history of the music in the borough. Tony Pabon wrote that song, and he was an old rock and roll guy. So one day he was fooling around and he came up with that, ooh, ah, ooh, ah, I like it like that. And uh, it just took off on the radio. I'm the first successful band leader to come out of the Bronx and represent the Bronx, New York, and everything all over the world. But coming out of the Bronx and going to all the boroughs, I opened more clubs and dance halls in the Bronx than anybody. From the birthplace of salsa, this is Sylvia Anglin for BronxNet. Thank you, Sylvia, for that report, and we look forward to next year's Salsa Fest. And once again, um, Salsa on Orchard Beach, which kind of like uh, Salsa Fest seeped into, is going to continue for the next couple of weeks, so make sure you check out the website, ilovethebronx.com. All right, welcome back to the studio. Rina Valentin here. Our next guest is the producers. Uh, he's actually a producer of Bronxnet's Emmy-nominated show called Open 2.0. He's here to discuss how students can become involved in interning for Bronxnet and eventually produce their own show, just like he did. Please welcome to the show Open 2.0 producer Justin Rodriguez. Hello, Justin. Hey. It's so weird being on this side of the set. Why? <laughs> Usually you're behind the scenes running around. It's more comfortable. I get to just sit down and relax for a minute. You actually get to sit down and relax as a producer? <laughs> no, be here. Oh, I here? Oh, yeah. right. <laughs> no. I was about to say, I'm like, wait a minute. I don't see Shirley sitting down relaxing anywhere. <laughs> Shirley's our producer here on Open Fridays. Uh, anywho, uh, let's just share with everyone a little bit about your process. Yeah. Okay. Um, 2.0 is more or less, it's a teen talk show. It's um, teens coming from different high schools around the Bronx, from high schools like Truman, Lehman, um, St. Catharines, uh, Mount St. Ursula, Aquinas, and they all come in and they pretty much do everything from camera work to eventually producing like I am, to hosting the show, um, actually being guests on the show, TD, audio, everything that interns for shows like this get to do. Okay, so you're using uh, television terms. Uh which yeah. some people who might be watching are, are not familiar with. Um, and, and that's awesome, right? How, how did you start? How did you learn? And where did you find out about this, yeah. this program? Well, I started when I was 15 here at BronxNet right. as, um, as one of the teen interns. Um, not part of 2.0, part of an old teen talk show that was here called Teen Talk to Glennis. And basically, I started doing on-air stuff, as you do, you know, hosting and stuff like that. And um, from there, I just always had an interest from behind the scenes thing, working with the cameras and stuff like that. So I asked one day, um, do you guys have another internship? I ended up interning here at Open. And after a while of interning here, I pretty much, you know, went behind a producer, asked around, didn't stay quiet, you know, went around, talked, uh, met new people, and just building connections, you know. And from there, I started assistant producing for one of these shows. Um, and then 2.0 came about, and Marissa knew, who's the, actually the intern coordinator here, 
knew that I had an experience. I was a teen intern. I know what the process is like. So she said, is there anyone better that can do the job than someone who went through it before? So working with the teens, I ended up becoming their producer. So I helped them book their guests, schedule their shows, pretty much helped them build their show and create the show that they want to do. Nice, nice. Nice, very nice. And so you were saying Open 2.0, it's teen-based, teen design. Let's yeah. share a little bit about that now. So what happens is teens come in from different high schools and they get the chance to pretty much express their creativity by having guests that they want to see, things that they're interested in. You know, like teens, some, some teens are interested in um, fashion and modeling, so we had a giant Open 2.0 fashion show. Other teens are interested in music and the arts, so we had like a mini um, music concert episode. Other interns are interested in comedy, so we did a we created a comedy segment for him, and he gets to come on and do a what grinds my gears every week, and um, it's actually been really popular now. So teens get to come here, express what they want to do, create the TV show that they want to watch, and yes. whoever doesn't want to be on air gets to do everything like learning the cameras that they've been dying to learn. You know, it's great because I remember when I first got here, I had no idea what I was doing. I got here, I, hold the I was holding the camera, and I'm like, which one is the zoom, which is, I have no idea what this is, I was shaking. So for them to come in and I see them start off how I did and then get better than I am very fast is amazing for me to watch. Interesting. Now, uh, what is the process uh, now, let's say, working with Open 2.0? Like, can somebody just kind of call uh, in and ask, oh, can I be a host? Like, isn't there a process yeah. that they have to go through? Um, well, it's not um, too much of a process anymore. It's more or less an open studio. So we ask the kids to um, the kids that we have. We ask them if you have a friend or you know anyone that you are friends with that are in school that has an interest in broadcasting. Bring them on, and honestly, we get a big turnout with that. A lot of the kids' friends come in because a lot of, not a lot of kids have access to things like this. Right. You know, everything is hands on. You know, when you go to an internship, you're there and you're doing coffee and tea. Right, And, right. you know, get the donuts or go walk my dog or something. Right, right, Here, everything's right. hands-on. So when the teens come in, they come in in packs. And they're, they're ready and they're, they want to learn. It's not like they come in and they're sitting down. They want to get experience. They want to try everything. You know, they're very open-minded. That's very cool, very cool, especially when you're in that type of environment yeah. because it's kind of like, uh, you know, earlier we said kids rules in the uh, segment with Henry Ovalles, but now it's like teens rule, right? Yeah. This is a teens rule, exactly. open 2.0. Right. How old are you now? I'm 19. 19. Wow. Congratulations to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're certainly very proud of you here, Justin. Thank you. Uh, you've come a long way. And, and uh, not to mention, you're part of a work that is Emmy nominated. That's, that's really big. Yeah. It's, it was when I found that out, honestly, I was very proud of the teens. I was very proud of, you know, being part of that. But I, I couldn't take the credit at all. I was more or less, you know, the, these are the teen shows. They created everything. It's their thing. And having Marissa White in the studio showing the kids and everything was, it was great. So having her come up with that idea, because it was her idea originally, and um, it was a great experience to have that. Yeah, and so where are you now with this? Um, now I'm still producing their show. Um, doing Right now we're in the midst of planning some more outdoor things for them so they can get field experience. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to plan out this sort of an outdoor music show. Sort of like what you guys did with the Fordham Road, if you remember. Right. And right. we saw the success and how amazing that was. That me and Marissa thought this would be a great opportunity for the kids to do something like that, and we could have you know all the open hosts come on and have a lot of the music people in the Bronx, like people artists in the Bronx who are up and coming. Nice. So it'd be everything from poets to performers, dancers, a couple of musicians thrown in the mix. So you know, a, a show where the teens can express their music side. Beautiful. So uh, once again, Open 2.0 airs right here on BronxNet Channel 67. Yeah. Can you give us the air times? Uh, or days? It, it comes on Mondays and Fridays at 4. Mondays and Fridays at 4. Yeah. And also, if anybody's interested in becoming part of this whole Open 2.0 family, whether it's hosting or behind the scenes training, uh, how do they do yeah. so? Um, if you want to become an intern for Open 2.0, you can call you can call the Bronxnet number, or you can uh, visit the website Bronxnet.org, or you can email Marissa Marissa at Bronxnet.org. Marissa at Bronxnet.org and Justin Rodriguez, we're so proud of you. Thank you. He, he's here behind the scenes on Open as well, so he works very hard. Congratulations Thank on all you your so endeavors. Much. And once again, if anybody's interested, any of you uh, teens out there are interested in being part of the Open 2.0 process, all you got to do is send an email to Marissa, and that's with two S's. And, uh, excuse me, it's one S, M-A-R-I-S-A, -S at bronxnet.org. Once again, that's Marissa, M-A-R-I-S-A, -S 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 at bronxnet.org. And you can always 
check us out at bronxnet.org website. All right, thank you once again, and we have to move it along. But when we come back, uh, well, we are going to hear the sounds of uh, the music that we've been listening to throughout the show in our Open Artist Spotlight. Don't go to her. We'll be right back. Big dreams and good grades aren't enough to get into college. There are actual steps you need to take. Finding someone who can help is the first and most important. For the next steps, go to knowhowtogo.org. How you doing? Hi. Hi. Have a nice day. You too. Thanks. If only child abuse were this easy to recognize. If you even suspect abuse, call 1-800-4-A-CHILD. All calls are anonymous and confidential. Trust your instincts. My name's Brandon. In nine years, I'll be an alcoholic. Hi, Brandon. I'll start drinking with the older kids. And whatever they do, I'll do. Kids who drink before age 15 are five times more likely to have alcohol problems when they're adults. So start talking before they start drinking. I know we'll start with alcohol. I'm just not sure how it's going to end. And welcome back, everyone. The stage is all warmed up and the lights are shining for our Open Artist Spotlight. The Open Artist yeah, Spotlight is made possible in part with public funds from the Bronx Council on the Arts through the New York State Council on the Arts Decentralization Program. As I've already introduced, our open artists specialize in world Latin and flamenco music. This band's guitar play, vocals and melodies will move you to the core and make it feel like you are in the old city of Spain. And well, they're gonna give us a little taste of some gypsy key music. Let's give it up once again for Los Cintrón. No tiene la culpa Caballo le da sabana Porque es muy desgraciado por eso No me pregunte llorar Ese amor que nací de esa manera No tiene la culpa ah. Mi vida yo la prefiero Vivir así 
All right, that's not exactly, that's not exactly flamenco, pero, you know, I know I could get it down <laughs> it like good. this. All right. Wepa! Oh, you guys are so playful. I love it. Wepa! Los Cintron, everyone! Love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. That was wonderful. Oh, wow. 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 That was so refreshing. And uh, we have to share with everyone before we run out of time how you guys are actually going to be playing on a cruise ship this Sunday, July 17th. Correct. Yes, yeah. on the Jewel, right? That's right, that's yeah. right. It lives on 23rd Street. On the um, east side of Manhattan. On the east side of Manhattan. Oh, just speak into the microphone to so make sure yeah. that they hear you. It lives on 23rd Street. Right, yes, yeah. thank, you, thank you, thank you. 8 p.m. 8 p.m. Uh, on in Manhattan. And uh, yeah, so that's this Sunday. And of course, people can actually get the tickets online. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Actually, you can go to lareinadelbarrio.org to get your tickets online. Yeah, nice. How do you like so that? It'll be nice. yeah. a, lot, a lot of fun. Yeah. Yes, it is going to be a lot of fun. We have dancers, I mean, a larger group, and. Uh, it's beautiful. It's a cruise. Yes, you can have flamenco dancers as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, it's a cruise to nowhere. We, well, it's, we shouldn't say nowhere. It's going to be around the city, um, mm -hmm. but it's nice. Oh, there we go. The there Gypsy, the Gypsy Kings cruise, which is July seventeenth, and uh, that's going to be this Sunday, July seventeenth. And uh, if you want more information on the event, you can go to kobeevents.com. Kobe is spelled K-O-B-I E events. K O B I events dot com to obtain more information. And once again, I send you to larenadelbarrio.org to get the tickets. And that's happening this Sunday. And uh, well, as you can see, it's going to be very elegant and <laughs> maybe even a little romantic for you romancers <laughs> out there. So make sure you Perfect. get out there on Sunday. All right, we're out of time. Thank you all for coming through. Thank Love you. Woo! That's all the time we have the for the show, Coming people. Up. Uh, of course, uh, you know, yeah. we want to thank all of our guests. And, uh, but before, well, okay. Yes, please, please do play. Yes, I just want to take a moment. Uh, well, when she gets here, she's getting here, she's getting here, to wish my beba a happy birthday. My daughter, Charm Vither, is going to be two years old on Sunday. Yay! Thank you. My name's Brandon, nine years old, being alcoholic. Hi, Brandon. I'll start drinking with the older kids. And whatever they do, I'll do. Kids who drink before age 15 are five times more likely to have alcohol problems when they're adults. So start talking before they start drinking. I know I'll we'll start with alcohol. I'm just not sure how it's going to end. How you doing? I just want a uh, regular, no sugar today. You got it. Thanks. Hello. Hi. Did you eat that whole thing today? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Hi. How, how are you are doing? You? She's getting big, huh? Good. Yeah, she is big. Oh, uh, hey, haircut. Yeah. Yeah. Looks cute. Come on, let's go. Nice to see you. Thanks a lot. If only child abuse were this easy to recognize. If you even suspect abuse, call 1-800-4-A-CHILD. All calls are anonymous and confidential. Trust your instincts.